Hi, everyone, and welcome to Nothing Venture, Nothing Game. As always, I'm your host with the most, your GM, Jared. And today, I'm joined with Rules Arbiter Steve. Yep. And we are doing a assessment of a new tabletop game that just came out. Uh, it was Kickstarted. Kickstarted? Kickstarter? Kickstarted? Uh, a, last year, and I finally got it. I got the whole bundle because I loved it. I got the PDF. And I got the book and the GM screen, and it's called Die, the role-playing game. And it's by Rowan, Rook, and Descard. You can find their website in the link below, in the info below. It's a link to the website to get the PDF. It's currently $25 uh, on their website. And it's a 416-page 416 tabletop role-playing game based on the comic written by... Kieran Gillian and the art, the artist who wrote the com who did the Karen co comic was uh, Stephanie Hans, and Die, the comic is kind of like imagine a, if the kids from the 1980s Dungeons and Dragons cartoon went back as adults, and the world continued after they had left that's kind of like how the comic plays out it's a very short comic it's wonderful it's really great brings up a lot of really cool concepts and i highly suggest reading the comic but the cool thing is you don't have to read the comic to play this game it does help but you don't have to so this is the, the hardbound book it is, is that pretty more, awesome more, is that over your face because they can't see it over your face there you go oh. so this is the hardbound book uh that is the cover you know, the bind, and it comes with a little red Fancy. tassel. Let me jump into kind of like an overview of what die is. So die is referring to the singular of a dice of game, right? So a die, you pick up a die six or a D six, as we say now. Um, so basically die, the RPG is a role-playing game based in that comic universe that was created. Uh, in Die, you play a group of authentically flawed real world people and that, who get sucked into this fantasy universe. Um, some of you might want to go back for whatever reasons. Some of you are mad you're back. And you kind of you, you play the game out as both of these characters. So when you play Die, you create two different characters. You create your persona, which is your fictional real world character so i wouldn't be playing jared i would be playing j rod in <laughs> die <laughs> yeah, right god like, damn you sorry um so i would be playing j rod not jared i wouldn't be gm jared i'd, I'd be gm j rod in this fictional die universe and steve would be uh stefan right i hate you like <laughs> come on you knew it was coming and that's how you would play so you would create this persona and then when you get sucked into the die world, you're playing your Paragon, which is the fantasized version of that of character. That character, yeah. It's a, it's a very meta game. Um, Th think then, think uh, uh, like Narnia, right? Because yeah. those those characters were whatever they were in the real world, yeah. which is already a fantasy character, and then they get sucked mm -hmm. into an alternative world, and then they spend so much time in that world that they kind of become these other characters, and then they yeah. come back, and then they have to deal with that dichotomy of their characters of who they are exactly. And yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. So it's a very meta game, um, and that is the concept of the game. Uh, going into even greater detail, the world of Die is like this amoral god. <laughs> That's more or less Galactus. It's Fantasy Galactus. It's Fantasy Galactus, right? And every time you play a fantasy game, you create this, like, they call it like a, a fictional egg that lives in the die Galactus universe. And whenever your characters die or, or stop playing, that world is consumed by Fantasy Galactus or the, the die amorphous entity um so that actually does come into play as you play through the game uh it's a very sh it's it's again a very meta game like if you're really like it the, the it's a weird system because it has great rules 
but then it has like this very meta concept and i feel like you you can have like the traditional tabletop role player enjoy this game because of the rules and then you could have a non-traditional tabletop role player enjoy the game because of the metaphysical wobbly stuff so remember when you were playing that one game of chrono cross and you stopped and you turned it off and you never went back to it it got eaten it got eaten <laughs> it's gone forever gone just gone <laughs> um but uh so now you want to play the game right so we're going to make characters or we're going to build characters and the characters and die are broken down by kind of like a class these are your paragons right not your persona this is your paragon i kind of wish they picked two different names instead of like persona and paragon double p's yeah um but so you're you're creating your paragon so the character you're going to be in this fictional world that you're playing with your friends in um so you have your the director the emotion knight the fool the neo the god binder yes. and the master so the, the master we're going to get we're going to push the master to the side for a second yeah. but the master is a special one because yeah. So even the game master in the game plays a character. I mean, I've, obviously yeah. they play all the characters, right? But the master is, I, this is what I'm saying, is like the, the, the 80s D&D cartoon is like a perfect anagram for this yeah. game because the game master, that little gnome guy that floats around, he's a physical character in the game world as the mm -hmm. master is a physical character inside the game world and they ha are bound by certain rules one of them is the ability to cheat, but even that is bound by rules. So it's an interesting concept yeah. of like throwing the GM on their on the on its head for a little bit yeah. because of the way the master works. But it actually is a character class, which they also give you rules on how to play a master as a player character. But that's a little different. There are a little bit more mm -hmm. restrictions, obviously, because the master is is the game master. They get a little, lot more leeway when it comes to changing stuff. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting it's, that everyone is playing a character, not yeah. just the players. Yes. Um, and additionally, when you choose to pick this persona, uh, this uh, paragon class, right? Like, let's call them classes, right? The best way there, it, it's your class. It's your yeah. class that you're playing in this fictional world. Every class or paragon, as it's known, is given a specific die and you only need one set of dice so we are all dice goblins here we all have tons of <laughs> dice sadly you only need one and you only need one set so going from a d4 to a d20 is all you need and every class or paragon gets a specific die that they use only to themselves so the director gets a d4 while the emotion knight gets a d8 and it, it changes depending on again your class slash yeah. power con um, uh you also you will need a bunch of d6s that's that's oh, that is d6s. the thing yeah, yeah. Uh, besides your class die everything runs in d6s so we're gonna uh jump into a general remember this is a general overview we're not gonna go dive deep into like every nitty-gritty piece of rule in this if you want to see something like that let us know in the comments down below but we're generally going to talk about the core mechanics and how this game kind of flushes out. So your characters all have the six main stats that you've seen in most tabletop role-playing games. If you played Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, they'll look very familiar. Strength down to charisma. Um, um, combat is super fast and super simple. It's on page 11. Basically, every time you start a combat encounter, your guard gets reset back to its deck score. So don't worry about having it deplete. And that get like you don't need to to sleep to 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 shake it off. Your hit points, that's like, another story. That's yeah, hit points are a different story, but your guard does get refreshed every time you enter in the new combat scenario. Um, and then you have your basic things. Movement, there are so this is where, where it gets a bit wonky. If you've ever played like Edge of the Empire, uh Star Wars Edge of the Empire, uh there uh there are just or if you've ever played in the card RPG, one of our favorite uh of a favorite rpg I, I like to play um there are just ranges so you're either in melee or you're me medium distance from a group of enemies or you're really far away and it's it's very narrative based so it it, it doesn't really lead to maps uh you could probably play with maps if you really want to or miniatures but it's more of a, this game is more narratively based in combat yeah so you have a movement and an action on your turn just to kind of make this quick um mm -hmm. and you can 
basically go from close to melee or melee to close with your movement um, to go from close to medium. That's your action. And then yeah. you're from medium to far. That's your whole turn. Yeah, you're just holding yes. Um, and then you have your attacks, and it's general, like, I swing, I punch, I maybe use my special ability. They do have really cool, like, kind of outside the uh, uh, box. One of them me and Steve were talking about earlier was, uh, it's called team attacks. If, let's say, me and Steve, and we haven't gone yet, want to, like, you know, dragon, like, super Kamehameha, like, attack the dragon over there. Uh, if we haven't gone, we can combine our attacks to 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 uh combine our turns to make a team like a team attack yeah just the one thing that just the one thing i want to go over is this right here is can we showed it earlier is basically the core mechanic of how you're going to roll anything in the game ever and mm -hmm. basically they this is a dice pool oriented game so every time you're going to do something you have to you're effectively generating a pool of dice yes and then you're gonna gather your dice. Oh, it's strength. Okay, well, I have a three strength. I'm gonna pull three dice. Or or it's intelligence. I only have one intelligence. I'm gonna pull one dice. Whatever the stat is involved, you're gonna pull that many dice. Now, if you can add your class die or not, that's based on your class. Um, if there's any advantages that you have, whether by another player, by the environment, or by something you did earlier, every advantage is gonna add a die. Every disadvantage, which is basically the exact opposite, it's slippery. You can't really see that well, or anything that's in in the environment mm -hmm. that the GM associates that is a disadvantage takes away dice. Then you roll the dice. Fours are better or successes. Anytime that there's a difficulty, it removes successes. And then at the end of the results, how many results do you, if you have any successes left, you succeeded. And sometimes more successes equals more. You did better. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. having more successes doesn't really help you. And rolling sixes means you can activate specials. Certain specials require you to spend one special. Some there is double or triple specials, which means you need two or three D6s. And there's a whole set of rules on what specials are. And obviously, they're each different for each class. And even certain situations add their own specials to the whatever mm -hmm. you're trying to do. So that's kind of like generally what you're going to be doing all the time when you're, when you're rolling any type of dice in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the general gist of like how to run this game. Now we're going to kind of jump over now to classes and we're going to start with the first class in the game, which is uses the D4 as their class die. And that is the director. Well, let's see. Now, pause right there. Uh, the artwork, the full page artwork for the director. That's dope. Freddie Mercury being boss. <laughs> that's just Freddie Mercury being a boss. That's a standard issue. Freddie Mercury, by the way. Uh, in my head. Um, <laughs> By the way, they are standing on, uh, they effectively are standing on a D4 with the top cut off. Yes, yes. And they are just So rocking. dice are really relevant in this game. So you'll, you're will you going to see even on the character sheet there, uh, the, like I said, if you look at the first page of the director, the symbol for this character's class is an unraveled D4 because that's their class die. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to see a lot of references to dice. Even the world itself it's a D20. It's a D20, yeah. And that's what Galactus is. And he likes to eat all the little faces. And basically, your world exists on one face of the D20. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. It's like War World. Back to the classes. The director. Steve, take us through the director. It's a D4. It's badass Freddie Mercury. How, how do we get here? Yeah, director. So the director, uh, as you see here, it kind of basically describes is the words you say and the emotions you invoke effectively can control the emotions and actions of other people. You're basically a walking mind control person, uh, kind of. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, it says you to play a dictator. If you want to be an artist who performs, warps other emotions, and even creates magical effects, use your imagination and creativity to work out exactly what your awful gift can do, because you may not even know how powerful you are, uh, and be hated and feared for very good reasons. I love that. Yeah, the dictator is pretty awesome. So effectively, you have to pick an emotion that you invoke and you use to power all of your abilities. So if you're going to notice here, yeah, um, there's a cool wheel, almost like there is like traditions in magic from other games. Uh, there is a wheel and each 
pedal, they call them pedals. Each pedal has three different emotions on it and that you can use if you pick those. So if I, if we pick vigilance, we get vigilance, anticipation, and interest. So those are the emotions that I might be able to pick. And as I get higher level, I might be able to pick more pedals to be able to widen my ability to manipulate things. Like one of them could be loathing, disgust, and boredom, or grief, sadness, and pensiveness. So you can be able to pick an emotion that you would like to mess with effectively. And basically it explains where they got the emotion will come from. They didn't develop it. They, they got it from somewhere else. But moving forward, let's hop over to the fool, right? Cause we gotta get through. Um, so the fool if you, is basically- Yet again, I, we're I gonna actually, start with the artwork cause the artwork, yet again, I think the artwork is, is really This good. character is really cool, it's it, beautiful. It, I mean, we, we say this a lot of times when we see artwork. I, I like I said, I don't think I've ever seen artwork. They go, "Oh my god, that's horrible artwork." Yeah. But we're getting to the we're getting to the fact that I think this really invokes the theme of what they're mm -hmm. trying to get at. Yeah, the, the the crazy smile while arrows, and they're doing like this insane whatever. You flourish, I love the fool. whatever. Yeah, I I would play the fool. I, ironically, um, so the fool their symbol is the unraveled D six. Right again, you are playing with a bunch of d6s, but they're the special d6, so you could have like the silly, like you know, the 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 generic d6s, and then the fool would be the really cool d6. There we go, distributing the dice as uh, the because we're talking about the fool, and this is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. So you just so the beginning of the, the the game, the master goes through. Start with all the players, other than the fool, in order. They take their dice: D four for the dictator, D eight for the emotion knight, D ten for the neo, D twelve for the godbinder. Lock eyes and, and intensely recite. I think this part of this is a joke, uh, but my opinion. Mm -hmm. But this is your die. There are no die. There are no other die like it in this whole game. This is special. This is yours. Use it well, and then you insert cl class name here. And then put the, and put it and you put the dice in their hand. And then the fool should be given their dice last with a slightly tweaked ritual. This is your die. This is exactly the same as every other die in the <laughs> game. There's nothing special about this die at all. Use it, fool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's amusing. I think that's um, hilarious. That's, that's fun. I I think if we do do this as like if we do do if we ever do play this, I'm totally doing that ritual. And, and then and then you hold the big D twenty goes. This is mine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just, like I said, I partially think that's a gag. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, if that's if they were serious about that, I apologize. But I, I'm, I'm assuming that I'm getting, I'm giving humor from that. 100%. I, yeah, I think, I think that's a bit humorous. <laughs> back, um, to, so, back to the fool. Back to the fool. Uh, so basically, the fool is your look. You laugh at death. You, you danger. Um, you know, always looking on the bright side, as the song goes. It's true. If a fool's laughing, you'll get out of hell alive if you're laughing your enemies won't be laughing for much longer don't take things too seriously and it won't get too serious the fools the swashbuckler romantic rogue the life and the soul of the adventuring party the rest think they're irresponsible but the fool's abilities mean the only responsible thing to do is be irresponsible <laughs> uh, so screw everyone else if they can't take a joke fools rush in and their friends have to deal with their consequences <laughs> i up. like that <laughs> They Leroy Jenkins themselves into stuff. Um, and and again, it's very the creation. Uh, all stats started two, and you have two points to increase any stat you wish. Then they tell you fools benefit from dex and charisma. Uh, depending on how you want to play them. Uh, depending on how you want to play them. So your look, unlike the dictator, your look gives you defense one. So remember we talked about how like defense is your armor class. This one you have defense one. Um and then it can be anything. So it says, like, over here, you have a long cloak balanced between elegantly wasted and scruffy or black leather and a deck of cards and uh, fast fingers. You know, so you can make a character look like anything they want. I think it's pretty cool. Um, and then, the, like I said, the D6 is the fool's die. And I, I so the D6 is really fun. You get to add your fool's die whenever you're doing something foolish. It literally <laughs> says that. So uh, you, you, your dice foolish, is Foolish, or cavalier. Yeah, you can add your die, your dice pool. Uh, you can add it to your dice pool anytime you're acting foolish, daring, or cavalier. In any dice pool, with in, which includes the fool's d6, you gain access to the the special um, special roll in the d6 and add it to the presented dice pool. So anytime, so you get like you get to add more d6s. So it makes you be more outlandish. So again, you have to be careful. 
Uh, I, I feel like each class is like, you have to be careful who you let to play the fool. <laughs> because if I'm the fool, I, you know I'm going to be foolish. Just just to throw this out there, uh, anything, any people were like, you see, so I'm like, oh, wait, if I just keep rolling sixes, there's a rule in there that once you activate a special, you can't activate the special on the same die rolls. Yeah. You can activate you other specials, yeah. but you can't Not keep this. activating the same one, unless it says you can, which is pretty rare. Yeah. Um, and then they have something called flukes. So this is based on your D6, and it's really interesting. So this kind of harkens back to like old school a, uh, AD&D, where you would only be given, uh, when you got the box set, there was always two D10s, and then you had to turn one into the 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Um, so what happens is a fluke, choose one face of your D6, and you draw a circle on it in a non-permanent marker. So obviously... I would reason... just write this on your character sheet. If you don't yeah, want to write on your dice. Yeah. Um, if you roll that circle, as well as the usual effects of the number underneath, some fluke of luck will happen to your benefit. So it's it's something awesome. So if I'm like trying to jump over like a bunch of enemies and I add this to my dice pool, remember this is my specific fool dice. And whenever I use my fool's dice, I'm using this die. So if I roll it and I get that circle, Whatever I'm doing, it becomes exu just so much more. So, but if you roll your fool's dice and it didn't roll the fluke, you add a circle to a different face. So I can continue adding circles. If you did roll a fluke, you have to erase that circle and add a cross on a different face. And the cross, every time you roll it, every time you roll a cross, that's a negative outcome. So I still do something foolish, I just, I swing over the guards and I topple into another room and there were guards playing cards in there. And now like, now negative, uh, like, yeah, so I did something cool, but now there are more guards coming. So the three guards now is six guards. Or, so it, or it, when uh, Han Solo is talking to the guards and the, yeah, yeah, and he's like, how are you? <laughs> Who is yeah. this? Like, oh crap. Ah, and he just shoots it. That's, yeah. that's a very, everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? Who is this? What's your operating number? Yeah. That's a fluke. <laughs> and then again, it says like, if you roll every time you're doing this, it's a continuing thing. So you roll a circle, you erase that circle. You erase uh, all circles except for one. If you roll a circle, you, you, you erase all except for one. And if yeah. you do uh, get a circle, you also add a cross to another face. Yeah. And then every time you roll a cross, you erase the cross. Uh, it's the same effect. You, you erase all crosses. Yeah, you erase all crosses. Sorry. Yeah. So it's a continual balance of like, because remember, Good you're, you're going to be using that fool dice constantly. Yeah. Um, and then you have if all else fails, and then remember how we spoke about the dictator uh giving their their die to someone? This is the fools kind of giving their die to someone. So, but they give it to the GM, and they do say GM, which I think is is interesting. Um, so the GM says, like, oh, you've knocked in the door, 24 guards come rushing out, and as the fool, I could then give my D6 to the GM to get us out. Like, it's a get-out-of-free-jail card, right? So I'm like, here's my die, GM. I'm really sorry. You got to figure out how to get us out of this safely. So all the guards grab us, and they're like, halt. And then all of a sudden, the princess who saw me doing my amazing thing is like, no, daddy, I love him. And it becomes a whole thing, and I like, we don't get slaughtered, right? <laughs> But the, the first the first thing I'm thinking of is in Spaceballs, it goes, these are not them. You captured their stunt doubles. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've got their stunt doubles. So, Princess, you thought you could outwit the Imperious Force of... You idiots! These are not them. You've captured their stunt doubles. Um... And then you see them running through the hallway somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, that's literally what happens. Uh, but when the GM returns to die back to you, at super now we have to have a wedding. Now I have to marry the princess. They have me. So now we're going to get married. And that's the negative aspect, right? Maybe Obviously, I'm playing a fool. I don't want to settle down right now. Uh, so I, I I can't get out, right? Like I, I, now we're being forced at gunpoint to get married. It's shotgun wedding. Um and I, I thought this was funny. It's called taking a piss. So if, if the GM gives me back my die, 
I can then turn around and if I give it right back to them to get out of this like super negative effect, uh, it's called taking a piss. And then like an even worse thing happens. The GM has free reign to mess you up good and proper when return and when they return it. Don't take the piss. So going back, like I can't instantly get out of jail free card every time. It's it's I, I have to accept it at certain points in time. Um, so that's that's more or less the fool. Uh, so now we're gonna move on to C's favorite class. Literally, he said, like, oh man, this is my favorite class when I looked at it, the emotion night. So Steve, take it away. Uh, you should know all about the emotion night. Go. No, I'm sorry. Page. This this artwork. I have uh, a don't. sword with eyeballs on it. <laughs> no. That's burning in fire. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that's a dope picture. And similar to the dictator where they use emotions to control other people, you are basically ha, 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 a paragon of your emotion. <laughs> but up bump Puns all day. Uh, these are Order of Knights, uh, the world's greatest warriors, each devoted to one of the eight sacred emotions, whether it be joy, hate, or fear. Uh, if they feel, if they can feel it, then they can use it to fuel their power of their sentient arcane weapons. So basically, you're walking around with a, uh, an intelligent weapon that wants to do things based on that emotion that you selected. Uh, when consumed by this sacred sensation, they are incom with they incomparable warriors, capable of miraculous feats. Nothing can stand against their blades. Armies, mountains, not even ideas. They can defeat anything except the passion which drives them. Ooh. And let's get to the meat here. As an emotion knight, your powers are driven by your feeling of a specific and sacred emotion. Choose a word from the emotion wheel, uh, which is the same one we saw earlier in the chapter. Uh, yep. Uh, we, we see here. I'll take a bigger picture right here. You can see all the different emotions. You get one of those emotions. You choose one word from the emotion wheel. Uh, that best fits your emotion, that that emotion, you write that emotion into a blank space on the top of your character sheet uh, to denote what type of knight you will be. All, all three words. Oh, no, you get all three. You do get all three. Yeah. You, uh, you, so you choose... Your pedal. You choose, you choose the, a whole pedal. The whole pedal. Okay. Um, Yeah. And then that... The, but, yeah, they, they focus on all of it. Gotcha. Uh, let's say your second emotion can be one of the one most related to your per so you could be your personas conflicts or your your paragons conflicts or or something about one or the other. Uh, they suggest if you're looking for if you're scrambling for something, rage is the easiest one because everyone knows how to be angry. Uh, so everything obviously we said before that you get this basically this magical this arcane weapon that is fueled by whatever emotions uh, whatever mm -hmm. pedal of emotions you select. All the emotion knights' special abilities are channeled through their weapon. Your weapon also has a personality, whether it's aggressive uh, pursuit of the emo of the sacred emotion, it has a critical voice, um, adorable opposite you'd expect for your weapon. So whether it's like you're you're like rage and anger, and it's like the happiest thing in the world, <laughs> like uh, Navi, like hey <laughs> hey listen, that just drives you into that drove me into a rage when I was old <laughs> playing on the N64. It was like hey listen, that like made me fly off the handle. That'd be my weapon. It'd be like hey listen, I'm like. Whoa! Imagine, imagine, character concept. You're mm -hmm. playing a rage uh, 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 emotion knight, and the sword you draw is an elegant sword, because it has cool. to be, and it's the Frank yeah. Sinatra sword from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Wicked witch cry, and all. <laughs> and it just, just keeps singing. singing like awesome songs. Just, yeah, and you're that would like, drive me <laughs> insane though. That would drive me to madness. It would drive me to rage. Yes, I was having it. This is why you're angry. Like, yeah, I was having a vein just eternally running through my forehead. <laughs> okay, well that's the weapon. Well, okay, that's what the weapon does. But what is this thing about the sacred emotion? Uh, so emotion knights keep track of their secret emotion with the emotional scale using your emotional knight's dice which is a d8 you track your how much of this emotion you're channeling or you're feeling at that moment determining how intensely your character is feeling oh, feel, yeah right there move the counter up or down the scale and your gm will also give you indications where that needs to move up or down mm -hmm. so it starts at zero so there's nothing on the dice uh as you start gaining in strength and basically feeling and channeling this emotion, 
you'll you'll see here that okay, so you you're at level one, you're emotionally engaged, and you add a D8 to attacks. Stance is uh, stance is active and can use venting abilities. And we're going to get to what that means here. It all yeah. goes to two, three, four, five, and six plus. Um, and it kind of goes into like once you reach. Uh, well, uh, yeah, most humans pass out once you're getting to level four because you're just like you're a giant emotion monster at that point. Yeah, you're overwhelmed. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, level one is feeling emotion strongly. Level two is intense. Three is overwhelming. And then you get progressively more abilities as it goes through. But also remember, you're this is how much of this emotion you're dry, you're feeling in and of itself. So at some point, this emotion starts taking over at higher and higher levels. Uh, but yet again, the powers you gain from channeling this much emotion is the like overcharging Green Lantern's power ring and just like like annihilating a planet. No, not maybe mm -hmm. not that crazy, but you know, like here, you know, with you know, creative violence is one of your abilities. You could defeat uh, a mob, a blockage, a village, or, or or a strength. And at level three, you can defeat an army, a mountain range, a town, a weakness. So as it gets higher and higher, you can use your uh, creative violence in more devastating ways in terms of mechanical effects each level will give you a disadvantage on doing something against the emotion so if the effect could help a task you get a simple a single advantage which means it just means adding a dice uh it is possible for the gm to suggest compulsions and what basically oh you're at level two and this thing happens you're going to want to do this Right. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of the GM kind of taking control of your character, but it is because you're getting so much power that, you know, like I said, your your emotions are at that point are driving you. So sometimes you don't you won't think clearly. So almost think like barbarian rage where you may not be focusing your rage. You may be focusing serenity. You may be focusing XD. You may be focusing fear. You may be focusing terror. One of these other things that that you're not going to be able to think past that emotion. So sometimes the GM was going to give you prompts to say, you kind of have to do this right now. Or to not do this, you're going to have to roll a check or you're going to have to take a penalty to do something else because this is so intense. Uh, so now we jump over to the D10 or the Neo. Uh, the Neo is an interesting character. They run off of something known as Fool's Gold. And this is the first time you'll hear us talking about it. Fool's Gold is basically, oh, sorry, not Fool's Gold. Fair, Fair gold. gold. Fair Gold. Sorry. I apologize. Uh, lots of words, uh, fair gold, and uh, they so the nano is the cyberpunk character. Think literally cyberpunk, like they it literally says, like, hey, uh, play the ne neo if you want to be chromed up cyberpunk rogue in a fantasy adventure party. Literally mm -hmm. says it in the thing. So, you're it's a cool picture. Remember, you're the d10, so you got this really cool picture of the neo that. The thing in the background, that like weird robot thing, kind of looks like um, the the tripods from the uh, War of the Worlds. Mm. But so they use this stuff called fair gold. Fair gold can be found throughout the game. So on dead enemies, if you get a special stuff, you you kind of collect it. You wake up in the morning and you, you, have you start the you start the day with a fair gold, and then you make some checks. You can possibly have more. And fair gold is used to power your abilities, some of your abilities. Um, additionally, there's entities known as the fair, which tie into the lore of this world. And the fair are kind of like just entities that judge the world. Um, and they think like they're like celestials from Marvel. That's the best way to put it. Like they show up, like wrong, like, and they judge the what's going on. Um, they more or less don't really interact with the world too much, but apparently they drop gold while you're playing in their universe. They they want to give you money. Um, so uh, the fair gold works like that. So the the so fair gold. Let's talk about fair gold. We kind of explained a little bit. Fair gold is techno magic fuel which powers your gifts. It takes the form of a small coin, which you find yourself drawn to instantaneously that will likely frighten you. Fair gold is most commonly found upon the corpses of other fallen. Fallen are like the generic monsters of the world. Previously uh, dead personas or paragons. Th yeah. Uh, a techno magical creature that hunts die. And you're known as a die. Um, but you will find other sources. Your AI will be able to tell you if there's any fair gold in the location. 
you do have a HUD, so you have Cortana from Halo. <laughs> um, a single piece of fair gold is required to activate the Neo's gifts until the following dawn, include any, including any of its upgrades. So as you level, obviously, upgrades. Uh, each Neo has slots on their body where they can insert the coin. You put the slot wherever you like, apparently. <laughs> uh, most find it on the back of their neck, but you may be different. So, where is your us, coin slot? Put it in yeah, the comments where is down your below. Coin slot. That's kind of what it's asking for. Uh, <laughs> keep track of how many fair gold you have. They dis every morning. They all disappear. Yeah, you so start. You, you start with you, one. Yeah, if you've collected two hundred of them, and then the GM's like, "Okay, you take a nap and you wake up it's tomorrow morning," that no more. Uh, so now you have nanotech. You always have an AI system and basic ability to access the fair field, an invisible data network fueled by technology sufficiently advanced enough to pass as magic. So uh, there's an old saying, uh, any technology at a certain point just looks like magic to people who don't understand it. Uh, your AI system is capable of talking with you and performing basic tasks related to your gifts and upgrades. Accessing the fair field allows you to hack fallen computers or automaton systems and anything technologically. So if it's tech, you can hack it. Um, subverting them to your control or shutting them down. To use your nanotech to overcome an immediate problem, roll a dice pool based on your int. A success lets you bypass a problem. The success for each problem, if there are multiple ones, dice pool has special. Actively, uh, the die pool has a special. Remember, we talked about specials. Uh, actively subvert the system to perform one action. So you get to kind of over, over, over. Yeah, just beat the beat the beat it up. Yeah. Uh, gifts of the fair. The Neo has access to otherworldly cyberpunk tech, robotic limbs, loyal automatons, smart weapons. If you've ever seen uh, like cyberpunk that was on Netflix, or even like the Fifth Element where the guy shoots the gun and the bullets just all go back to that uh the the target dummy. That's kind of what you get. One shot. Replay sends every following shot to the same location. Uh, when rolling a die pool, which is assisted by any gift, the Neo includes their D10. So if you have, that's your die, remember? Uh, gifts all have narrative effects. In addition to any mechanical ones, they allow you to perform suitable access tax. A jetpack lets you fly. A teleport lets you teleport. The only way you get fair gold is through combat. And like we said, like Steve said earlier, you have a lot, hit points aren't in abundance. So being constantly in combat, while is cool, is deadly. Well, yet again, you're also your AI can sniff out in, if you're near fair gold and other means in within social situations. Maybe you can barter for it. So <clears throat> there's ways to get it. There's ways. There's other ways to get it. So it's not just combat. We're up to the God Binder. This is your D12. So it's a lot of cool things. Basically, you don't believe in gods. It says right here they exist. You know it, and you actually make deals with them. So it's a lot of like haggling with gods, which is pretty cool. Um, they're cleric for the most part, quote unquote, kind of clerics. They 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 talk shit to their gods sometimes. I, I like um, this line from the flavor text is you don't believe in gods, you believe in tools, useful tools. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Um contact with God. Choose one of the following gods from page 87 to 96. So in the book, there's we'll a, get there. a bunch of different deities, right? Um, this is the god. You have a special relationship with that. What's their name? You actually get to make up the god's name, but it will be like, uh, so if you go to page 88, right, it's blank, the god of the wild. And so you could be like, it's, it's Steve, the god of the wild, <laughs> right? And that's, that's how you, that it a blank name. And they say like, talk about out with your GM, you know, figure it out. Uh, you have the first level of the relationship of that god with all the benefits described as in. Uh, you can add a D12 to your dice pool anytime the god's power is influencing it. So if you turn into a bear, you can include your D12 in the dice pool for whatever the bear attacks you're doing. Uh, if you create a magic sword, you get to add a D12 to your attacks, whether it's a scripture or a miracle, you get to include a D12. So again, you're the cleric, so scripture and miracles. So we'll go hop over to that scripture. Uh, there are a certain set of spells the Godbinder gets to cast. Remember, we said there aren't really spellcasters. The Godbinder and the Fool are the only two that can kind of cast like your G12 
generic spelly spells. And the master will get to that. And, well, the master is its own. Th- yeah, the master yeah. is its own. Yeah, the master yeah. is the master. Um, the, these spells are known as scriptures. Uh, the rope magic that you learn, uh, some come from specific gods. Some are accessible from any god whatsoever. All god binders gain access to three scriptures. Uh, so, and, the, and then these are your three scriptures. So it's noun, blast. So attack target at medium range. Remember, we talked about that range distance. So if if uh, I'm using Steve, the god of the wild, uh, it will be the Steve Blast. Um, <laughs> or Wild Blast or, or, wild or, blast or whatever. Or whatever the yeah. insert thing here. Uh, you have heal. You can heal a character within a short distance, max one health per character per encounter. So remember, every time there's an encounter, you can heal. And then detect noun. So again, I could detect yeah. Steve. Uh, I know whenever Steve is around. Yeah. <laughs> Determine if any of the Steve is within a short <laughs> distance. Or it's the noun. It's just the noun. Rolls a one when casting. The scripture incurs a god debt. You owe you owe you owe Steve a debt. I owe Steve a solid. So Remember, what's you, the don't god wanna, you don't want to owe me money. No. He'll come for you. He'll break your knees. Um the god debt is how the mechanic uh you work with your deity. It's it's a very interesting thing. For each god, a god binder can acquire up to five debt or god debt. Um, you can also be in credit to a god for up to five god debt, effectively making your god debt negative. Uh, if you're in debt, the god debt can be called at any time. The god will request a you can complete a task. It's up to the god binder what happens next. You can accept and complete. Uh, you accept and fail. Or you could just flat out refuse. And if you refuse, you suffer one wound for every point the god depth the god chooses to remove. So they they could just wipe you out if they're like really mad at you. Well, yeah, and also there it's it's the it's the agreement. So like, hey, you'll you're gonna clear two debt if you do me like you may owe four, right? Yeah. But your god may come to you and say, Hey, if you do this thing, I'm gonna wipe out two of that debt. And you can go, F you, you just take your damage. Because it was yeah. it was what was wagered at the at that whatever that action was maybe something mm-hmm. that you can't do or whatever and you say no I can't do that you're gonna take the damage of how much you would have gotten back yeah and then it says like if you act in accordance to how the god would like you to act the debt can start to just be removed mm-hmm. so if you're the god, if you're following the god of the wild and you save like a bear that you might if you have let's say four debt you might now only have two and you're like oh cool I only got two. I don't know how you would know. Or, Maybe you, you just have like a tally somewhere. Yeah, a tally probably on your character sheet. But also that's probably how you accrue credit too. Yeah. Is that if you had no debt and then you did something good that the god likes, that's how you accrue credit, which is which is like I said, it's effectively negative debt. Um, and then like as you level, it says choose level in God, and that right next to you says add a level in a god. This can be in a new god or an old one. So that's how you, every time you get a level in a god, you could start to either grab new gods to start to deal with, um, or you can... Increase the FEC. As you right now, I'm looking at the storm god and the trickster yeah. god. There's different levels, and it lets you do more things with that god mm-hmm. if you're the higher level. So you can choose to get higher level in one god or spread out and get more gods under your wing. Um, that's yeah. really on how you want to play it. The, who rules the master oh, rules? Oh yeah, hold on. Let's let's go back here. There we go. The master. The Who's master the master? Show enough. Show enough. <laughs> Greatest movie ever. Um, Who's the master? Show enough. Who's the master? Show enough. The master has a really dope picture because of flaming yes. eyes and like they control all the d and look and they the, even have their hand up and they're controlling all the dice and that the one d twenties over their eyes. Yeah. <laughs> This is like a really cool better Thanos. So the cool thing about this, and we mentioned this before, but similar to how the players have a real world persona and then they have their paragon. So they have what their character was before they got sucked into this world and then what they turned into once they got sucked into this world. Now, the person who's sucking them into this world is the master. It's the person that the GM is playing is the major antagonist of the story. So the GM not only is playing the GM and doing all the stuff with all the NPCs and building the world around the players, but they also are, just like in any game, but they are also the antagonist. And the antagonists get special powers because they are the master. Uh, so one of the things is, yeah, the, the, 
the rules rule and you rule the rules and yeah, you absolutely. never ever cheat ever like, maybe um, uh, yeah uh, oh yeah this is the gm section and we can be honest they cheat all the time yeah <laughs> So obviously you facilitate the game. You break the rules of space, time, and narrative to cast powerful magic. You cheat reality to get what you want, but at great risk. So like I said, there's a little bit of like you're GMing the game, and this is a little bit of you're playing this other character that can manipulate the game and do weird stuff, but yet again, you're bound by rules, and then you're bound by rules that let you break those rules. So, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's yet again, it's, it's super meta. So meta. <laughs> <laughs> and like it's so confusing because like like i i have my own things to say i'll say it at the end continue please continue Steve. I'll... so when you're building out your master character this is the antagonist character that you're also running that has basically magic powers mm -hmm. so just like players you start with all your stats with two and you get to increase two stats uh that you wish with two points high intelligence high constitution are most connected with masters you get to pick a piece of equipment as you see on on the on the screen there um you get pick your look which all are defensive zeros which you could be fetish wear out of a 1990s vampire larp which i think is hilarious uh you can kill a suit straight Shot out of the 1980s <laughs> what shots fired <laughs> fetish wear straight out of the 1990s vampire larp why are you coming for me like this, Die? Why are you coming for me like this? They, I, why are you coming for Steve like this? Uh, rude. Rude. Uh, Shots fired. You could be kill, uh, killer suit straight off of a 1980s corporate bad guy, or you could be wizard robe set of a 1980s kids fantasy cartoon. I wonder what cartoon they are referring to. Shall I show you how strong my power is, Uga? All right, so as the master, your dice is the D20. And the D20 has a special, special, which is when you roll a 20, you get to basically count as two successes. That's really all mm -hmm. it does. Uh, you generally, you can add the die anytime you cast magic. So the this is the major spellcasting class. This is the rules. Now, just to clarify, these are the rules for the master being played by the person running the game, the game master. Yeah. There is rules later on, which we're not going to go into, of how you can have a master as a playable character and they do so get less yeah. but they pay effectively there is ways of playing a master as a playable character there may be reasons for that you want to narratively do it or maybe you're playing with a lot of people and everyone has one of the other classes and you want to fill out someone with playing a player master for almost versus the the, tr the true master um and they kind of go into that uh, i think both of us have good and bad thoughts about this mm -hmm. uh you want to go first jared Sure. So first and foremost, um, the positives of this is it's really interesting. I could see playing a longer campaign, longer than like the four sessions they suggest. If you ignore the other hundred and something pages at the end of the book, <laughs> because they do go into a lot of like how you should run your campaign, how it affects. So how the world is affected because remember you're playing in their universe so similar to like forgotten realms and galarian you're you're kind of playing in their world kind of kind of with that being said you could definitely play this as a long running game i feel this game has a lot of interesting things i feel um it combines two of my favorite systems vampire the masquerade or white wolf um and then they and and your typical ttrpg right your your dungeons and dragons your pathfinder and they kind of put them together very well done but with that being said there's a lot of stuff at the towards the end that we didn't get into which is like running the games how the the game the master should run while you're playing and that also threw me for a big loop uh playing the master and also running the game I understand they're supposed to be the antagonist, but I'm also leveling up, and then I'm not allowed to cheat unless I have cheat points. But also, well, you can, but it could be detrimental to your character. You like lose yeah. an arm or something. Yeah, yeah. But like it, and then like that character is also part of the meta conversation where you make your these personas, 
and that becomes very meta and i feel like i'm not like i feel like some parts it became so meta as i was reading this i was not struggling but i was like what because it also refers to the game master as like the game master you would like me like the person running the game and i was like wait are we talking about the master or the game master and no they the same they are the same entity but also not the same entity at the same time another positive i really liked is as you progress in later on into the book into kind of like how to run the game and and how to create the persona the rituals uh character creation the tables returning to the tables and such like that um there is a rule on how to quit the game where everyone just kind of agrees that the game is over and if they yeah that that's like a whole nother thing but the one thing i wanted to go into uh, oh i found it right here so as you progress later on like they have QR codes and they suggest using that as resources, die resources. Oh yeah, perfect. You. I actually have that page, I think. Yeah. So it just takes you right away to the resources that you need in the game. So that's a positive. Another positive are the monsters, really thought out monsters. Uh, they have influence from both actual mythology, like our mythology, our, our world mythology. Actually, if you picked up this book and just used the bestiary, for like even running other games like let's say i was using i want to use this b series and just kind of have a conversation and talk about like griffins and learn more about griffins i would gain a lot from just the bestiary in this it's it's honestly they could just kind of like take that out and turn it into its own thing and i would get i would gain a lot from it as a gm um so those are the positives right the qr codes the game itself it seems is very fun uh, we haven't fully played it out. We we played a few, I played the beta a few times. Uh, this was in beta before it was on Kickstarter. You can download the beta for free. Now it's out uh, for twenty five dollars. It's a PDF. Uh, I got to play the beta with a few of my friends. Um, it was interesting, but again, I dismissed the whole master concept and the cheating concept because I'm already doing so much, and I feel like that's that adds so much more to the the plate of the GM that's building this world, this narrative, these stories, dealing with the double character concept where you both have a persona and the paragon and the persona, you play the persona. Like at certain points, like you're not in the game world and you're in the real world and you're playing the persona in the fictional real world of the real, real world. And again, it becomes very meta. Um, and that, that's that's my two cents. Sorry, I, I went on a rant because I really did like this. Like, that's the whole thing. I like a good portion of it. It's also a good portion I could build without. Uh, all right. So, yeah, similar to Jared said, because there is a whole section that we actually didn't go into is like making your persona, which is your mm -hmm. real life person that you're fictitiously making that gets sucked into the world. Then you can make your paragon. Your paragon is your fantasy class. Whether it's yeah. one of the one, one five ones we went over, and also the master, you know, that whole thing, yeah, yeah, right. So there's a variety of questions, and it's kind of like a group, almost like session zero, where you can kind of together make all your characters, how they got together, why they chose to leave and break apart, and after the number of years, why did they choose to get back together when they were adults, and the whole reason why you're playing this game again, knowing that you're going to get ripped into this other world. At, at, at that some point, when you're kids, you didn't realize you were going to get sucked into this other world, and you all make it made it back, and then you're just choosing to go into it again when you're adults. Yeah, There's a whole series of questions that let, basically you ask and, like I said, group activity to try to figure out what kind of personas you're creating for yourselves and the interpersonal relationships that you have with the other players. And then you get transformed into the world and you make your fantasy character. So you have to juggle two different, and I even tell you, they're two disparate personalities, your fantasy character and your real, your real world character. So the two disparate mm -hmm. personalities, I mean, you can make them the same, but you can make them different. I will say for the standard fantasy people that I know I played with, and I play with a lot of people, whether they're at conventions, whether they're uh, in my game store, whether they're just friends that I play with, for the people who generally play your generic fantasy games, 
even generic fantasy games, when you make your character at first level and then you go into the world and you just go out and kill monsters, a lot of that stuff gets thrown out. So now we're asking you to do twice as much work. Yeah. And a lot of that stuff is going to just get there. Now, if you're a, the particular group that loves the and you, and look, I'm not saying that you don't like combat at all, but if you love the narrative side of Dungeons and Dragons, you like the narrative side of a lot of role playing games and you feel that Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder, a lot of these mainstream RPGs don't give that to you and you want more narrative, this could be an interesting option, which still keeps up the, it's still heavily mm -hmm. fantasy and it's still getting in the sense of you have these really cool abilities that let you affect the world around you. And they, the five different classes, they're, they are very different. And it's not like, like, oh, I'm playing a ranger, but I just walk around with a sword all the time. And kind of like, I'm kind of like the fighter over there who walks around with a sword. No, they're, as we talked about with all the different classes, these are vastly different characters. Even characters that use and manipulate emotions, they are vastly different from the dictator to the uh, emotion knight. And then you have the, the, the weird thing with the fool versus and the mess, messing with luck and fate then versus the, the neo. You know, the God binder bending gods to their will. You know, you have all, the, all that cool. Look, they're vastly different. So you're going to have fun with playing the different classes. And yet again, combat isn't necessarily the main focus here because hit points are at a premium. And you can, you hit zero. Mm -hmm. There's no like, oh, I make a die. No, you're dead. Like 100%, you hit zero, dead. So they, so there is combat. And then sometimes something to say is combat could be avoided, combat couldn't be avoided. But this is a much more narratively focused game, but less so than other like purely indie uh, games that are like pure narrative and a minuscule of combat. This is like riding the line of like 50% narrative, 50% combat, I would say. I think this, you're right. This kind of rides that, that line hard and fast. Thank you very much to hanging out with us. And hopefully you, this sparked your interest in picking up this tabletop role playing game. Uh, in the description down below is will be a link where you could go to the website and grab it for 25 bucks um they didn't sponsor this does this not sponsored i don't think i said that in the beginning uh um i just i think uh this game is really interesting i think if you're a fan of trying multiple different indie rpgs like we are uh this should be in your top 10 to give it a try uh, for the price point of $25 for 400 pages, plus an extremely well thought out bestiary that will get your cogs rolling. Uh, I think it's worth it. Um, so yeah, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, do a solid like and subscribe, you know, all the jazz, click the buttons, do the things. Um, we'll get there when we get there. And uh, so from all of us here at Nothing Invention, Nothing Game, we love rolling dice, giving advice with a little bit of that New York spice. Say goodbye, Steve. Later.